Well, good morning, everybody. I see as we have participants joining us, we're up to over 80 now. That's excellent. Let me introduce myself. I'm Josh Brown. I'm the Executive Director of the Puget Sound Regional Council. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy days to join us for a webinar to go over the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, um, also referred to by its formal name, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. You know, IIJA is the most significant investment in our nation's infrastructure from the federal government in decades. It was a historic coalition of partnership and leadership from Congress and from our president to be able to make this law reality. And now we have the opportunity to get the most out of these once in a generation investments. Now, the bipartisan infrastructure law, it's definitely overwhelming. There's a slew of, of different funding programs and priorities, water, transportation, uh, internet access. The work that we do at the Puget Sound Regional Council is very much focused on the transportation aspects. And I would maybe simplify and say that there's three major buckets of transportation funding within the bipartisan infrastructure law. Number one are formula funds that come to states and come to regions. PSRC distributes hundreds of millions of dollars of transportation funding on an annual basis. That's built into what we refer to as a transportation act. The bipartisan infrastructure law formally authorized a multi-year transportation act at the federal level to help fund those programs that PSRC makes available to the region. There's also uh, on a formula basis, new programs that have been made available. We've been working at the regional level with our legislative leadership. In fact, we just wrapped up this past week meetings to talk about new funding programs, things like the PROTECT program, which is geared towards fish culverts, bridge maintenance and, and repair programs that are new, uh, as well as carbon reduction programs. With those new formula programs, how should those be split between state and, and local uh, parties? The third silo, I would say, outside of both the established formula programs and new formula programs are competitive grant programs. And I think what we're trying to get out of today through this webinar is to help the region and the state of Washington better access uh, all these new competitive grant programs so that you can understand the full landscape of funding opportunities. This is very much a marathon and not a sprint. There's a lot to learn. There's new grant announcements coming out all the time. Uh, but we thought uh, that we were at a good stage to, as at PSRC to be able to give a, a, an update, a webinar to be able to help our regional partners really understand where there's opportunities. Again, we have this once in a generation lifetime to be able to maximize this, these investments in the Puget Sound region and Washington state. And I'd be absolutely remiss if I didn't give a big shout out to our congressional delegation. Our two senators and our members of Congress worked tirelessly to be able to get uh, this this bill signed into law, and uh, we can't thank them enough for their incredible efforts. Now let's get the most out of those amazing investments. So today, Doug Cox, one of our excellent transportation planners at PSRC, is going to give you an overview through this webinar. We hope again to answer a lot of questions, but I trust that there'll be even more questions afterwards. That tends to be the case. So we really look at this as as the first of of several opportunities for us at PSRC to work with your regional partners uh, on this program. So with that, Doug, take things away. Great, thanks very much, Josh. I really appreciate that. And again, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today. As Josh mentioned, I'm Doug Cox and I'm a relatively new planner on PSRC's transportation team. I just began a few months ago uh, and one of my initial assignments right out of the gate uh, was to learn as much as I can about the bipartisan infrastructure law. I call it the BIL. Uh, but really want to uh, learn as much as I can in order to be a resource, not just for PSRC staff, but also for our members. Um, and I've reviewed a ton of information and materials that are out there. There's you know, so much information. Um, and really for today, really just wanted to share what I've learned so far, kind of run through those main points and particularly highlighting the most relevant transportation program. And really the goal for me is to, to help ensure that our member agencies start to have a baseline understanding of, of what's in the BIL and, and how to uh, tap into a lot of these upcoming funding opportunities. Um, also, as we go through this, 
I'd like you to please uh, think about the role you foresee PSRC playing uh, and how PSRC can support you as uh, your agency pursues some of these funds. Um, so <laughs> just a few housekeeping items before we get going. Uh, so it's a webinar format, so attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, we'll have time for questions here at the end of the presentation. You can please type your uh, questions into the Q&A box as you think of them. And uh, at the end, we'll do our best to answer them. We might need to follow up on some of them afterwards. Um, but we'll also be posting these slides and a recording of the, this webinar to PSRC's website shortly after today. Um, also, when you leave the webinar, you'll see a prompt uh, for a survey. It's totally voluntary and anonymous, uh, and it will help us meet our Title VI requirements. So we greatly appreciate you taking that survey. Um, also, by the way, if you're wondering, I am wearing a sling on my arm. Uh, right as the summer was getting underway, I had a severe crash on my mountain bike, needed a couple of surgeries, and definitely put a damper on my plans for the summer. But, uh, you know, there's always a silver lining. <laughs> yeah, the good news was that this gave me even more time to focus on learning about the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, but also, I, I mentioned this just now, uh, because I'm doing this webinar with one arm, so if I fumble a little bit with the slides or anything like that, please forgive me in advance. Um, but anyway, so let's dive in. Uh, before we get to some of these specific transportation programs, I just have a couple of slides to disorient you all a little bit. Uh, and you know, as you heard Josh just say, this is a significant new surface transportation bill, you know, over $1.2 trillion over the five years of the bill. And close to half of that is going to transportation programs. The rest is going to other infrastructure needs like water, power, broadband, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, it really represents significant amounts of new spending almost twice as much as we were accustomed to under the FAST Act. Um, and so a lot of this money is gonna allow for increases to the existing programs that we're already accustomed to. About three quarters of the money will just go into the existing programs. But then the rest, the remaining quarter, will uh, be used to create a variety of these new kind of focused transportation programs with kind of specific goals. Uh, also, I uh, just wanted to share a little bit about how equity is built into the bipartisan infrastructure law. <clears throat> As you know, planning for equity is a big priority for PSRC. Uh, in fact, we just won the National Association of Regional Councils Achievement Award for our equity work. So we're really uh, quite pleased to see how equity is a theme throughout the BIL. <clears throat> uh, but even outside of the BIL itself, uh, there's what's called the Justice 40 Initiative. So this is a new initiative from the Biden administration. and What's behind it is to basically that it's uh, acknowledging that racial equity and addressing the climate crisis are immediate and overlapping priorities. And so this Justice 40 initiative, uh, it, the aim is to deliver 40% of the overall benefits of federal investments in climate and clean energy, including sustainable transportation investments. The aim is to deliver 40% of those benefits to disadvantaged communities. Uh, USDOT also has a new equity action plan. So this is specific to USDOT and it highlights their work uh, to expand access and opportunity to all communities with a particular focus on underserved, overburdened and disadvantaged communities. Uh, within the BIL itself, uh, on the transportation side of things, you'll see themes like expanding access to jobs and undoing some of the harms caused by past transportation projects. So you know, disproportionate pollution impacts, that kind of stuff. Um, and as far as the other infrastructure uh, side of things goes, the themes like, you know, ensuring the pipes serving people's drinking water are lead free and, and expanding uh, broadband access throughout the country. There's also a disadvantaged communities mapping tool. Now this is really not uh, unlike PSRC's displacement risk and opportunity mapping tools. Uh, this mapping tool will be used uh, for applicants to convey how a project is expected to have an impact on disadvantaged communities. So if you're familiar with PSRC's regional FHWA funding competition, very similar idea to that with using these uh, disadvantaged community mapping tools. And it's gonna be required for not all of them, but many of these specific uh, programs. And then these specific programs themselves, like you'll see uh, programs focused on funding projects that are gonna help improve air quality in disadvantaged communities and uh, programs focused on connecting places that have been cut off by transportation projects in the past. So equity is really a theme throughout this. Okay, so next I wanna dive into the details about the transportation programs. First, I'm gonna cover 
the highway and bridge formula programs of the FHWA funding. And that includes the four new formula programs that Josh mentioned. Uh, and then we'll get into some of the discretionary programs. That's where we're seeing a lot of these nuanced kind of focused programs with specific goals. And then we'll cover the same thing on the FTA funding side of things, the public transportation programs, again, starting with the formula programs and then looking at a few of the discretionary programs. Uh, and then I will share some of the most useful resources that I've come across so far. Uh, and then before we'll conclude by uh, taking time to answer the questions that you have all have uh, submitted in the Q&A box. Okay, so as far as the formula programs for the FHWA funding, uh, first thing to note here is that there's more funding flowing into each of those core FHWA Fed aid formula programs. So the table here shows the five-year amounts authorized under the BIL compared to the FAST Act. Um, and so with the increased money comes a few changes to some of these programs. And also, as we mentioned, there's four new formula programs at the bottom that are now being established. So starting off with the programs uh, where PSRC awards the funds, so I'm talking about STP, TAP, and CMAC. There's only no major updates to you know, how PSRC is going to be distributing those funds. There's nothing changing the law in terms of how we're going to do that. But there are some new specific uh, project types eligible, particularly like electric vehicle projects and resilience related projects. But really with the SDP and the TAP funds, the biggest change here is that the TAP set aside is increased to 10%. So if you don't know that the TAP funds are just like taken off the top of the SDP funds that are set aside. Uh, and by increasing that set aside to 10% of the SDP total, it leads to like a net increase in more than 50% uh, funding for the TAP program. So, you know, bottom line, there'll be more funding to award during the next TAP competition that we do at PSRC. Uh, the CMAC program, again, there's nothing changing how PSRC will manage or award funds uh, to specific projects for the, for the CMAC program. Uh, there are some new things that are eligible, including uh, replacing diesel equipment with zero emission alternatives, uh, for like Puget Sound Clean Air Agencies, Tacoma Rail on track for the future project that was just awarded FHWA funds is a great example of one of those types of projects. Uh, and also shared micro mobility, like bike share and scooter share kind of things are now eligible for CMAC. And as you'll see here in the table, there is 10% uh, more funds, but I'm not sure if that's going to lead to there being more funds to distribute because now the law allows uh, states to set aside 10% of those funds to do certain kind of lock and dam uh, projects. So I'm not sure if, if WATCH is gonna be pursuing that or not, but I'll be interested to hear about that. Um, okay, so now moving on to those uh, highway and bridge formula programs that uh, where WASHA allocates the funds. The first one there is the NHPP or National Highway Performance Program. This is the program that's focused on maintaining the national highway system. And uh, this has now added increasing the resiliency of the national highway system to the program purpose. Uh, there's a 27% increase in funding for this and some new project eligibilities related to resilience like undergrounding utilities, installing protective features, that kind of thing. Uh, the next one up, this is the HSIP Highway Safety Improvement Program. It's the safety arm of the Fed Aid Formula Programs, seeing a 34% increase in funding. And it's now going to allow things like education campaigns and, and projects that separate modes, uh, projects like roundabouts are now eligible. And this one also is gonna require states to conduct a vulnerable road user safety assessment. Then we have uh, the last of the existing formula programs, NHFP, the National Highway Freight Program. The main difference here, uh, other than this 14% you know, increase in funding is that uh, something that we've already been working with the Freight Advisory Committee on, but there's more miles to designate as critical freight corridors now under the BIL compared to the FAST Act. It went up to uh, 300 from 150 for the rural corridors statewide for each state and uh, from 75 to 150 for the urban corridors. So that's the big change on the NHFP side. Okay, so now uh, getting into some of these new formula programs, as I mentioned, there are four of them. Uh, the first up is the bridge formula program uh, and the BIL devotes a huge sum of money into repairing bridges like over 26 billion dollars over five years was authorized and I think you know some of the 
information I've seen, I think a conservative estimate is like that's enough for each state to fix more than 40 bridges per year on average. So um, we're going to be seeing a lot of bridges uh, being repaired here across the country uh, as this gets underway. And this is an interesting program in that it also even allows bridges that aren't even part of the national highway system uh, to be eligible for funding. So yeah, it's going to be a really uh, groundbreaking new bridge program. Uh, next up is the, there we go, the Carbon Reduction Program. Now this is a new program that uh, funds additional emissions related, uh, emissions reduction kind of projects. So very similar eligibility to the CMAC program. It's just that their funds are not going to be limited to air quality maintenance areas. It's going to be funding for you know any area in the country, I believe. Um, and this one also is going to require each state to develop their own carbon reduction strategy. Then we have the PROTECT program. You heard Josh mention this one. It stands for Promoting Resilient Operations for Transformative, Efficient, and Cost-Saving Transportation. Uh, $7.3 billion over the five years for this program. And at this point, there's really not a lot of other information out there about it other than here's what it's called and here's how much funding there is. It's focused on resilience. And there's also going to be a discretionary component too that I'll touch on in a, in a couple minutes here. But this is one of the new formula, formula programs as well. And then the last of these new programs is the NEVI program, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program. Uh, $5 billion over five years for this one. And the idea is to put EV charging infrastructure uh, on designated corridors throughout the country. So, you know, theoretically, you'd be able to drive from coast to coast in an EV and be able to charge up along the way. Uh, and WashDOT is, each state, including WashDOT, is going to be required to develop an EV deployment plan. And I, you no, know, Washout is wrapping theirs up, if, if not already. It looks amazing. And basically, it's outlining the interstates and some of the uh, higher volume highways as kind of the designated EV corridors and, and outlines where they're proposing to put the charging infrastructure. Okay. So that covers all the formula programs. Now it's time to look at the discretionary programs. <clears throat> First uh, uh, thing I want to share. There's funding increases to the existing RAISE program and the INFRA program. Those are, these are all competitive programs. Uh, RAISE used to be called TIGER or BUILD, now it's called RAISE, but it's a few billion dollars more for each of those RAISE and INFRA programs now. And then there's two new uh, programs related to INFRA. There's the Mega Projects program, which funds projects that are just kind of do, too big and too complicated for traditional funding sources, and then a, a rural focus program as well. And they're combined into one grant program called the Multimodal Project Discretionary Grant Program. And then we see all these focused new programs, each one with a specific goal. Uh, and local agencies and tribes are eligible to apply for everyone I have listed here, uh, as well as others. Now, there's tons of programs. I didn't include them all here. I, I just kind of highlighted the ones that I think are most relevant and interesting for our region um, and ones that our members would be eligible to apply for. So that's the ones that I've uh, got here. So let's go through some of these. First up is the Bridge Investment Program. Now, this one is on top of that $26 billion bridge formula program. So it's an additional $12 billion competitive program. Uh, this one, the Notice of Funding Opportunity, or NOFO, is currently open and goes through August 9th. And also, so for all these discretionary programs, if uh, if known, I've included the, like the date of the, the NOFO, whether it's open or not. And if you're thinking to yourself, oh, geez, you know, August 9th, that's really soon. I wish I had known about this. Um, these are going to happen more or less on the same time, time frame, like every year. So if you miss this round, it gives you plenty of time to, to get ready for the next one. So in addition to bridge program, there's this charging and fueling infrastructure program. And this is the program that complements the NEBI program. That's, that's the one focused on the corridors. This one provides grants for publicly accessible charging and alternative fueling infrastructure in neighborhoods. And you know, think of places that might not see a lot of private investment otherwise, uh, and putting charging stations near parks and libraries and multifamily housing, that kind of stuff. So a perfect complement to that uh, program focused on highway corridors. Then another one here, the Congestion Relief Program. 
This one's focused on large cities of a million or more and uh, provides grants for all phases of projects that lead to more carpooling, off-peak travel, mode shift, you know, anything that will reduce single occupant vehicle trips. And a relatively modest amount of 250 million authorized over the five years for this one. And here's that PROTECT acronym again. Um, this is the competitive version of that. There's that formula program and an additional 1.4 billion for the PROTECT competitive program. Um, again, not a lot of info out there yet. We expect to see it coming soon, but um, you know, it's likely gonna provide grants for resilience planning to do evacuation routes, uh, increase the resilience of transportation infrastructure protected from sea level rise, you know, uh, wildfires, extreme weather events, that kind of thing, in addition to replacing culverts, like Josh mentioned. And this will be eligible for port projects, highway projects, transit projects. But again, not much other info out there yet. Uh, the next one, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about this one already. It's a Safe Streets for All program. Uh, this one provides funding for plans and projects that will help us get closer to that vision of zero deaths and serious injuries. Uh, for this one, grants will be available to develop action plans, or if your jurisdiction already has an approved action plan, then you can get funding to implement the action plan to actually do the project in the plan. And I think about uh, three quarters of the funding will be going towards projects, and the other quarter will be doing uh, going towards the plans. And this also is currently open and closes on September 15th for this first round of funding. Okay, another one I wanted to highlight, this one focuses on uh, reconnecting communities that have been cut off by transportation projects in the past. And yes, limit, uh, it's, uh, freeway barriers probably come to mind right away for, for many of us. The program's not really limited to freeway barriers. In addition to that, like a lot of other things are eligible, including transit lines, rail lines, pipelines, even airports. So you know anything that is cut off a community in the past would be eligible for this, it sounds like. And these projects also will emphasize uh, disadvantaged communities. So I think if your project's in one of those areas, it's gonna be ranking much higher. I know there's a lot of interest in this uh, across the country. And this one's open now through October 13th for this first round. Okay, and then the last one I wanted to highlight here is the Healthy Streets Program. This one is focused on reducing urban heat islands uh, by doing things like increasing tree canopies and putting in porous pavement. And yet, you know, on days like today, it seems more important now than ever, right? Uh, so, and again, this is a program that will emphasize uh, disadvantaged communities. And also not a lot of info out there right now other than they've got uh, 500 million authorized uh, so far. And we're eagerly awaiting more details on this program. So that covers a lot of what's in, especially on the, the highway, FHWA funding side of things. But now we can take a look at the FTA funding, the transit programs. And uh, okay, so the main message really here, I've got the four main programs where PSRC has a role. All of them have big increases in funding, but really not much else is changing. No changes to the requirements or anything like that that's uh, noteworthy. But yeah, much bigger increases in funding you see you know, at a minimum 41% increase for the 5307 program and uh, state of good repair grants going up 67%. And then there's just like with the uh, highway side of things, there's some discretionary programs. Now, a lot of these are existing programs. <clears throat> um, and really, I think, yeah, the message here, just like with the formulas stuff, there's some pretty big financial boosts, but otherwise not really any changes to what's eligible or the requirements or who's eligible or anything like that. Uh, one I do want to particularly mention here is the low no emission bus grant program. That's a subcomponent of the 5339 program. It went from having a 275 million under the FAST Act to over 5 billion under the BIL. So clearly a huge priority right now for, for our nation to upgrade our, our buses to low and no emission buses. And actually it's not shown here on the slide, but there's also a low no ferry program as well that I just learned about. So that one might be particularly relevant in our region. Okay, um, there's also an existing TOD uh, just a 
pilot program. It's called a pilot program, even though it's been around for a long time. Um, but I know a lot of our members have tapped into this before and been successful, like City of Seattle and Sound Transit, I believe a few years ago, were awarded funds from this program. And I really like it because it supports housing and transportation, that connection between land use and transportation. And some, so 38% increase in funding for this program. Um, and they've now made it so uh, you can plan for a specific site. You don't have to just do comprehensive POD planning. So that's, that's one change. And also I've heard that FTA is going to be prioritizing these applications in areas that have higher rates of homelessness. So yeah, it's an exciting program. Okay, and there's at least one new discretionary program that I wanted to mention. Um, this is the SMART program, stands for Strengthening Mobility and Revolutionizing Transportation. And it's really a technology focused program for demonstration projects that improve safety and efficiency. So think ITS and connected vehicle type of projects. And it's not limited to transit, but transit's certainly eligible to apply for this one. So I really, uh, you know, thinking about some of the projects I, I've seen lately, this, might be particularly interesting to a lot of our, our members. Um, and yet, yeah, NOFO expected to come out sometime later this year, but not much other uh, details right now about that one. So those are the highlights. Um, I mentioned I would share some of the resources that I found to be most helpful. And we'll, again, we'll post this slide deck so you can just uh, open it up and have these direct links. But, uh, you know, the number one that you might want to check out if you're interested in this is the uh, White House VIL page. This blue guidebook there is a four or 500 page document that outlines a lot of this information for you. Really good resource. Um, USDOT's VIL page is also really nice. It's a good kind of a landing zone to, to go off for each of the other specific uh, transportation uh, agencies. So you can find out a lot of details about what FTA is doing, what FHWA, as well as all the other agencies as well, like Federal Aviation Administration, Federal Railroad Administration. <clears throat> um, there's the DOT Navigator, which is like a brand new website that they've launched that provides kind of technical assistance kind of resources for applicants. So definitely take a look at that if you're going to be applying. Um, FHWA's page is constantly being updated with new information every day. So that's definitely a really good resource for you to take a look at. There's also a link to uh, just a web page that has kind of what's coming up for the next NOFOs. I find that one super useful. And also WASHDOT's funding program page. That's where you can find a lot of details about some of these Fed Aid formula programs that they administer. And especially as some of these new programs come online, I think we'll be seeing some updates uh, from WASHDOT as well. So we definitely wanted to keep an eye on that. So, okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we really want to know, you know, how, how can PSRCs support our members? And, you know, what can we do to make sure that we're able to tap into as much of this funding as we can in our region? So we'd really love to hear from you. If you have any specific ideas, please enter them in the Q&A box. Or if you think of some later, you can please just email me directly, bcox at psrc.org, and I've got that on the next slide for you. Uh, so yeah, we'd really love to hear from you about that. And also, one other thing I just wanted to mention real quick. This is the number one thing that's been emphasized in a lot of the webinars that I've participated in so far. But any agency that's going to apply for any of these funds needs to have a unique entity identifier or UEI number. And that's replaced the old DUNS system. And so if you do not have one, you want to make sure you get one because they say it can take up to a month to get one and that would delay your application. So, okay, with that, I think we are ready to try to answer some of your questions that you have. Kelly, uh, if you're ready, uh, Kelly's going to tee them up and we'll try to answer them for you. I am. Thanks, Doug. Great job. Um, you've already answered um, several questions that were asked about the, the slides being posted. We will you we are, are going to make that available. And once we have the exact location on our website, we'll send that out. The first question I'm going to throw at you, I think, is a challenging one because I'm not sure of the answer. So we'll see if um, you, you've um, had a sense of this and all the research that you've done. Uh, a commenter asked about, uh, is there a standard state or national assessment 
for identifying vulnerable road users. And they mentioned a, one of the formula programs, I'm not sure which formula program was being referenced, but have you come across any reference to when we're speaking about vulnerable road users as it relates to these grant programs, is there a state or national uh, definition or assessment that's being referenced? Actually, that sounds familiar, Kelly. I don't remember offhand, but I want to say, yes, if it's the HSIP program, this is the one that requires states to conduct a vulnerable road user safety assessment. I think if you look closely at the HSIP, that's where we'll find more kind of specifics on how they're defining vulnerable road user. Perfect, great. Um, and I think the, the, the second to last slide that you had up ha answers this question, but a uh, uh, attendee asked if there's a link to all of the NOFOs. Yes, definitely. And uh, it is this bottom, second from the bottom, but, and you can also find this, I think, relatively easily if you go to like the USDOT or FHWA BIL page, it's, it's embedded in there somewhere. Perfect. Um, so another question, which we've certainly been talking about internally, and I'll, I'll let you field it, but feel free to punt back to me, or I, if Josh is still in line, he might want to respond to this. Regarding the Safe Streets for All program, the question is, does PSRC have plans for developing an action plan for the region? And Doug, I know we've been talking about it internally, so uh, if, if you want to get that started, but if you need to... Um, forward on to uh, Josh or I, because I know this is a, an evolving and emerging conversation. Yeah, and I think, you know, I know L MPOs are certainly eligible to apply for them, but, you know, thinking about the size of our region and kind of the scale of a typical kind of safety plan, it just seems like there's a little bit of a mismatch because usually those are focused more on specific corridors and intersections. So, you know, I'm not sure what the role is or, or the relevance to an MPO doing a safety plan. However, at, at least for that specific program, I think in general, it would be a wonderful idea, but I'll point that back to you at this point. Yeah, well, maybe I'll just share that um, we certainly, uh, safety was a big uh, uh, important component of our regional transportation plan. It's a big important component that was strengthened in our project selection process. We've also been kind of looking around for these um, grant opportunities. We're tasked with coming up with a regional safety plan, not entirely sure what that looks like yet. So we're working with stakeholders on that. So we've looked at the grant program. We're not sure if it's a right fit. As Doug said, it's um, it's pretty specific in terms of what an action plan might look like. So we're kind of still in that investigative stage. But Josh, I see you turned your camera on, so take it away. No, Kelly, you answered it well. And I guess the only thing that I would just add is a, a place to start is we're working with our leadership on a first stop being a regional convening on this topic, because I think it's really important that whatever work that we're doing at PSRC, it's regional in nature and it's supporting our membership. So we're not gonna do this in isolation. So that absolutely uh, may be a component, but we're gonna work with all of you on, on this phone call to help determine a, a good path and a good lane for us as an agency. Perfect. Um, questions are starting to pour in, which is fantastic. So another question, Doug, is where can they learn more about ferry project funding? Oh, a ferry project funding at uh, FTA's website would be a great place to go for that. Perfect. Um, are grants available for new pedestrian bridges over state highways? Um, well, you know, when you say over state highways, it makes me think of the reconnecting community pilot program. And yes, in general, I think that's exactly the type of project that would be eligible. As I said, there's lots of types of facilities that could be bridged and tunneled under and, and so forth. Um, so I think, yeah, you're, the Reconnecting Communities pilot program is definitely a program that would allow that. And in general, just to, to note, um, pedestrian bridges as a project category are certainly eligible under several of, of the formula programs as well. Good point. Um, really great question from Hans Hunger and Puyallup about there's a lot here and there's going to be a lot of details and how can we at PSRC assist communities with um, giving them a better sense of what are the minimum qualifications within specific programs. And other than this uh, level of detail in this presentation, Doug, we haven't really talked further, but I think that was one of the, the things that we were hoping to get out of this webinar is hearing what folks might need from us. So what would you say to that? Um, we, yeah, absolutely. We would want to be a resource. So if there's questions that we can help you answer in terms of what's eligible and what the limitations are and, and how to be strategic, you know, please reach out to me. 
and I will do, do everything I can to assist. Another um, thing that as, as we're getting these questions in, and thank you so much for sending them in, Doug, I'm also wondering if we can take the, the questions and answers and, and maybe start adding some additional uh, layers of information on the website. And if there are specific programs and if there are new things, maybe we can, as you did for on your second to last slide with that, I think you called it a UEI number. If there are some specific things that are new or unique to the grant programs, maybe we can start to um, provide some of that information out on that on that web page that we're going to build as well. That sounds great. Um, are there grants available for roundabouts? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of these different programs, roundabouts are an eligible project category. I know I mentioned one of them as adding roundabouts as a kind of a new eligibility, but clearly they've been eligible for SDP, PEP, and uh, CMAC programs before, as well as other programs, I imagine. So yes, definitely. Okay. So the next one is is tricky. So I'm going to read it off and um, um, I'm going to see you, Doug, if you come across any information that you can respond, but then if, if not, we can talk about it a little bit more, is regarding vehicle and equipment replacement and purchase programs, is there any assistance or guidance that PSRC can provide related to Buy America waivers for successful applicants? Um, and the comment is that most vehicles and equipment contain components from multiple manufacturers from different countries, and demonstrating compliance is challenging, if not impossible. Um, I know that we, to date, PSRC has, has we're just really not um, experts in the Buy America component. That's um, certainly, I know uh, our transit agencies um, deal with this a lot. Um, but Doug, before I turn it over to you to see if you've seen anything in, in, the, in the research you've done, one, one thing that comes to my mind is um, maybe we can start to do some outreach with our transit agencies and other member agencies and learn from their experience and kind of pull that into um, some best practices for folks. That seems like a great place to start, Kelly, yeah, because to be honest, I haven't really come across, that's a, kind of a really kind of technical in the weeds kind of level of detail that I haven't quite gotten to, especially with the transit side of things, but happy to learn more and, and share that. Okay. We, um, the next question I don't believe is applicable to the transportation funding, but I'll go ahead and read it out, Doug, because I know that you there we're we're focused here on transportation. We know that there are other aspects of the BAL, and it's um, asking about grants specific to updating sewage treatment plants. Sewage treatment plants. Oh, okay. Well, so that's definitely outside of the transportation realm that I've been focused on, but I did come across a little bit of information. I know there's uh, like, oh, through the Department of Ecology and through EPA, there's some of, some of the fundings are flowing through there. And I know there's a sewer overflow and stormwater grant. I know that's one of the grant programs. That's kind of the level of knowledge I have, but I, I got to imagine that yes, there is a, a, a program that funds that kind of thing for sure. And I would encourage that um, that particular uh, attendee to maybe reach out to Ecology or Commerce for more information. All right, um, next question. Can you speak more on the impacted PSRC programs? For example, when increases will come into play, new programs and new eligibility. Um, and Josh, if you're still on the line, I might I might reach out to you because you did speak a little bit about this during your welcome remarks about what we know today versus what's what's still in play a little bit. So we don't have a lot of answers there yet. Yeah, absolutely. So first, our established programs that many of you are very familiar with, programs like our Service Transportation Block Grant Program and CMAC, expect the same process moving forward from our agency. We have our funding cycles every two years. As there's expanded eligibility, we'll work with our, our partners and our membership to understand where there may, may be some new opportunities to, uh, to apply for those funds with some, some different focus areas. But um, part of what we're in, in the finishing stages of finalizing is different approaches with, with the new programs that Doug mentioned. So we're expecting over the next couple of weeks to receive a letter from legislative leadership uh, on a path forward for those funds in terms of what the splits will be between state and local programs. And in some cases, there may be a role for uh, PSRC as the Metropolitan Planning Organization to, to uh, play a role and um, 
help to make those funds available. So more to come. We hope to get that information out for the next few weeks as that gets finalized. Thanks, Josh. We do not have any additional questions as of yet. Um, oh, I, I lied. One just came in. Okay. Um, are there specific funding programs? Let's see if I can. Um, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to interpret this. Are there specific funding programs related to um, a new way to do level of service to provide multimodal transportation and support growth and economic development? Well, it's a good question. You know, that's not something I've overtly come across. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have a good answer to that question. I'm afraid. Yeah, and I know that um, the level of service question is is longstanding, and many folks are are looking into and working on um, multimodal level of service. But I don't know that there's um, specific funding programs related to that, other than just you know, like PSRC's criteria, for example, is you know, heavily weighted towards multimodal transportation. So, um, but we'll we'll keep an eye on that and um, feel free to reach out to us if there's a more granular question there. Um, bear with me because they're starting to come in faster. So let me let me uh, start reading through the next one and I'll try to collate that out. Um, okay, the Reconnecting Communities Pilot Program for projects to reconnect communities across highways, for example, the pedestrian uh, bridge that was mentioned. Um, the webinar that was provided specifically, I, I believe from the federal government on that, the commenter says it was much more focused on lower income communities. Mm -hmm. For communities that perhaps aren't um, categorized as that lower income level, is there another program that might be good to look at? Uh, well, I guess, you know, um... I still wouldn't rule out this program entirely just because it might not be in a quote disadvantaged community. You know, I think there's levels there that are coming into play. So I still wouldn't rule it out. But then yes, like Kelly said, a lot of those types of projects like a pedestrian bridge is eligible under other programs as well. So if, if this isn't the right fit for you, you know, there should certainly be other, uh, other ways to pursue funds. And I think um, maybe we can talk in terms of the, the, our wish to understand how we can be helpful to you. I'm, I am sensing a little bit of a theme that perhaps we can dig a little bit more into these programs and start to tease out some of those key um, criteria and requirements. And maybe we can start to build a little stable up there. Um, so the next question, um, the comment is, some of these programs sound like a lot of funds, but they are national discretionary programs. And so Washington um, may get no projects, maybe they'll just get just a few projects. Um, many of the, our agencies have limited resources in pursuing grants. Is there an opportunity to gather information on what projects agencies would like to submit to better understand what may be more competitive? And the comment is that this could save agencies resources if there are more competitive projects out there so that the, the region can be supportive so that um, boosting up the, the projects that are going to be more competitive for the national programs and leaving um, other funding sources available for those other projects. Um, I, I think that that's, um, this, this question and this, this topic of conversation was also raised at our Regional Project Evaluation Committee here at PSRC. Um, we can certainly do an outreach. We have not um, received that information from our member agencies, but there certainly were conversations about how the region can kind of band together. So um, I don't know that there's, we don't have a definitive answer on that one, but I think one of the things that we can do is um, serve as that regional forum, provide that information. And if, if more uh, agencies are interested in, in having that kind of regional, uh, regional umbrella, we can, we can continue to work with our committees and our partner agencies. But Doug, is there anything else you would wanna to add to that? No, I think that's a really smart idea. And so, yeah, I would I very much uh, like to see that. Um, an, another question related to multimodal level of service, are there data collection related opportunities? And I think the question has to do with, are, are there grants available for data collection? Oh, oh good question. I, you know, again, I haven't seen anything specifically saying this program funds data collection, but I have to imagine that, you know, as part of some of the projects that uh, fund planning efforts, that data collection would be definitely, you know, a part of that for sure. Okay. 
We don't have any new questions yet, but we can certainly just hang out for a little bit if any, we do encourage your questions. Um, and as Doug said, questions and comments related to how PSRC might be of assistance. Doug, from these questions, is there anything um, coming to your mind about things that you've seen or things pop into your mind about how we can uh, be helpful? Well, you know, I think the sharing like notices of funding opportunity, like making sure those are on top of people's radar and not slipping through the cracks, you know, that's something that we could easily do. I'm not sure the best forum for a venue to, to do that, but just, you know, even like little things like that, like, hey, you know, this program, the NOFO's getting ready to come out. Now's the time to, to start working on your application. You know, that would be something that we could certainly do uh, that comes to mind for me. But I, I also really like that idea of kind of serving as an umbrella just to kind of help coordinate and, you know, save resources for, for agencies that might, you know, realize their project's just not going to complete and they're not going to want to pursue it this round. I mean, that to me sounds like a, an efficient way to do things. So I really, really like that idea. Um, yeah, I think those are the main things so far. Okay, so we have another question and I'm gonna try to interpret this. I, I think the commenter is pointing out that we always, so for example, when PSRC does our project selection processes, we always have much more requested than is available. And the commenter is say, saying that it seems like the new funding is being set aside for new areas that may not be getting to the base needs. Um, how do we foresee this changing or it, uh, the question is, um, did they miss that? And I think maybe I'll try and Doug, tell me if you interpret this the same way. Um, there are new programs for, for some, some new areas, but there are also significant increases in our standard formula fundings as well. Um, but Doug, anything you would add to that? No, just that, I mean, I mentioned this at the beginning, like most of the funding, this new funding is going to those existing programs. So really to me, the takeaway is that there'll be, you know, that, that contingency list should be getting smaller as more funds are available for more projects. Okay, no new questions yet. Oh, see, it's a, it's a great prompt because then something always comes in. Mm -hmm. um, if PSRC could provide a brief overview of who is eligible and the requirements in NOFO email reminders, that would be very helpful. Doug, I wonder if you wanna talk about your famous spreadsheet. Yeah, definitely. And I have put together a spreadsheet that outlines all these programs that are in the slide deck and more. And I'm just kind of tracking that information about you know where, where you can get more information about who's eligible, all those details about uh, timing and amounts, everything like that. So I try to track that and it is, you know, it's like a moving target, it's constantly changing. So it's something I'm updating pretty much on a daily basis and tracking as I learn new things and find out new things. Uh, but that's uh, you know a, a resource that we've already put together that it would make it pretty simple to kind of uh, you know ex take excerpts from that and forward them on uh, you know as the timing warrants. Yeah, seeing some comments that um, folks would be interested in seeing that spreadsheet. Oh, good, good, good. Good. Nothing new yet. Well, and while we're waiting, Kelly, maybe this is another just quick reminder that when everyone signs off on, from the webinar, they'll get a prompt to take a survey. And again, it's just totally voluntary and anonymous. It's going to help us meet our Title VI requirements. So we'd really appreciate it if people would take a moment to do that. No additional questions yet. Oh, one more coming in. Um, oh, I think this is a question for me. It's asking about the time frame for when contingency funding will be announced, and it really, um, it really depends year to year. So we just finished project selection for our highway funds, developed contingency lists should additional funds become available. Um, but and as uh, Josh noted, we're still waiting to hear. Um, the outcome of the, the distribution of the VIL funds between states and regions. So um, honestly, year to year, it just depends on when we get final allocation numbers in um, and, and where we are in terms of our estimates versus actuals. So um, since we're just now uh, doing our, our project selection process and building our new TIP, it's going to be uh, some time. So 
uh, just stay tuned and we'll certainly keep you all informed as we as we learn more. Any additional questions, Kelly? Not, not yet. So um, we can hang out for a little bit, but but um, we can also end a little early. I see a few of our participants have started to to fall off. We're about nine minutes shy of ten a.m. Um, we're happy to to stick around until the till the hour. But Doug, do you want to do a, a closeout? Yeah, just thanks everyone. I really appreciate your participation today. I wasn't expecting so many uh, people to be on the webinar, so really. Really pleased to see that, and thanks again. And we'll get working on posting the materials to the PSRC website, so stay tuned for that. And we did have a question about when we might be able to do that. Um, I would imagine, if not this afternoon, early next week, we'll we'll try to get this up. And since we have lots of pages on the PSRC website, we will um, perhaps send a another follow up email out sharing that location so everybody has it. Yeah, and in the meantime, any questions or anything else comes up, please feel free to reach out to me directly. My email is ecox at psrc.org. All right, well, I'm not seeing, I'm just, I'm just Doug, I'm just saying, as, as you can probably see, I'm seeing a lot of thanks for the, for the webinar and looking forward to the materials being posted. All right. Well, Kelly, if there's no more questions, uh, you know, like you said, I'm happy to hang out, but it looks like most people are uh, signing off. They are. So I think I think we're good. And we'll, um, again, just more, more thanks and more looking forward to the material. So I think we can go ahead and close out. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Really appreciate it. Have a great weekend.